Well, good morning, everybody. I am Andrew I. Cohen, and I direct the Gene Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics, and I teach in the Department of Philosophy here at Georgia State University. Today's event is part of the continuing spring 2021 speaker series that is sponsored by the Gene Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics. The series is titled Ethical Dialogues Across the Virtual University, Multidisciplinary Perspectives, we have brought multiple distinguished scholars virtually to our community and fostered rich conversation about the ethical themes in their works. And before I introduce today's special guest, please let me promote a couple of upcoming talks. Tomorrow, that's Wednesday, April 14th at 12.45 p.m. Eastern Time, Iowa State University Professor Clark Wolf will visit with us to discuss the theme of human extinction. You could visit ethics.gsu.edu for registration details. Next week, we have two other talks. Zena Hitz from St. John's College will visit on Monday, April 19th at 1230 to discuss the uses of useless learning. And on Wednesday, April 21st at 1 p.m., Professor Jennifer Morton from the fabulous University of North Carolina will visit with us to discuss resisting pessimism traps, the limits of epistemic resilience. All registration information will become available at ethics.gsu.edu, which is also where we're going to be posting the recordings of all of these events. On to today's guest speaker. We are delighted to have with us today an old friend of us and the Gene Bear Blumenfeld Center for Ethics, Professor Mark Murphy who is the Robert L. McDevitt KSG KCHS and Catherine H. McDevitt LCHS Chair in Religious Philosophy at the lovely Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Professor Murphy is author or editor of six books on topics such as, actually eight books on topics such as natural law, divine authority, justice, and most recently with Oxford University Press, God's Own Ethics, Norms of Divine Authority and the Argument from Evil. Professor Murphy is also the author of dozens of other publications and distinguished venues on themes in value theory, philosophy of religion, theodicy, punishment, and many other themes in ethics and social philosophy. Murphy is also current editor of the scholarly journal, Faith and Philosophy. He's also the author of a book, Philosophy of Law, The Fundamentals, which the students at Georgia State University know quite well as a lucid and compelling treatment of the range of issues in legal philosophy. Uh, I'd also add that Professor Murphy is uh, really good at corrupting the young. Uh, so there's a picture on his homepage <laughs> that shows him reading to a, an adorable young child. And in his lap is seated a child at bedtime where Professor Murphy is reading Aristotle's ethics to his children. And the young person who is pictured there has since grown up to a life of impressive greatness and riches, <laughs> all in the right way, at the right time, with the right people, and for the right reasons. And come to think of it, that's probably better bedtime reading than what I do when I read my kids' Hobbes. <laughs> So today we are honored to have with us Professor Murphy, who will visit and lead a discussion on the topic of law without coercion. And Professor Murphy, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here, and uh, I'm glad to be a friend of the uh, of Georgia State Philosophy and the Gene Beer Blumenfeld um, Center for Ethics. Uh, I've been there a few times, and I and I wish I were there uh, physically in person right now. Um, but I'm delighted to be here uh, talking about uh, talking about legal philosophy. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, about law and coercion today, and I'm going to be sharing my screen. I'm going to be doing a presentation. I don't know exactly how this will run in terms of of question and answer and so forth. There are a couple points in my presentation where I do one sort of in the middle, one at the end where I definitely want to talk, uh, sort of open up to talk through some issues about sort of different directions that one might take. Um, I, you know, other than that, I'm going to have uh, 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 Professor Cohen, um, you know, sort of keep an eye. If, if, it seems, if they're like, you know, urgent questions of clarification, we can talk about those along the way. Otherwise, um, we'll just sort of see how that, see how that develops. Uh, let's just go here. All right. So, um, so today I want to talk about law without coercion and the, uh, the presentation. Um, Y'all can see my slides now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so uh, the presentation didn't advertise it with a question mark, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just put it with a question mark here. Um, uh, 
we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to be, I, I guess, I guess the way of putting it is I'm going to be um, talking through some ideas about the connection between law and coercion um, leading up to some, some, um, some current ideas, you know, very recently defended. Um, and we want to talk through some of those. So, so I guess it's sort of an unsettled question. So I'll leave it with a question mark. So, so there are a couple of, of connection issues in legal philosophy um, that are that are quite prominent, and um, and one of the questions uh, for those of y'all who read the uh, the philosophy of law book, um, the one that I sort of emphasize most in, in that in that sort of you know issue of connection um, is a connection between law and moral correctness, or about sort of the, the normative status of law, whether it gives good reasons for action, whether we're bound to act in accordance with it, and so forth. Um, and sort of one issue that sort of arises between positivists and natural law theorists is whether the connection between law and moral correctness correctness is necessary or contingent. I think I mean, you, you know, those of y'all who have read the book um, will sort of already have some familiarity with that. Um, but there's this other uh, issue which um, is also quite prominent in the history of legal thought that, uh, that I don't that I don't talk as much about in the book, but I take it from um, from some of the comments that Professor Cohen passed along. This was an issue um, that arose in y'all's discussion, uh, which is about the connection between law and coercion. Uh, this can have some implications to how we think about various kinds of law, particularly international law. Uh, and that's the issue that I wanna talk about today. I wanna talk about um, what we ought to think about, um, sort of what makes something law, what makes something a legal norm and a legal system, and what the connection is between that and coercion, between the fact that law, uh, you know, ex you know exercises some sort of co coercive power over those that are subject to it. And not just sort of accidentally, but you know, quite frequently, ubiquitously, right? Uh, it's not just something that they do all the time, but also something that's written into its norms. And you know, legal norms uh, characteristically authorize um, use of coercion uh, in, uh, in support of its norms. And, that's, and, and we might wanna know, so well, what's, what sort of status does coercion have uh, within law and, le and within, uh, with respect to individual legal norms and, um, and, uh, and legal systems? How ought we to think about that? So, so uh, we're going to be in, in order to do this, in order to sort of get the conversation going. I kind of need to assume a, s a certain understanding of coercion. Um, this can be it's, this is as uh, is its own sort of philosophical topic in its own right, um, and making and making some claims about the connections between law and coercion sort of requires you to already sort of have a background understanding of the sort of coercion that you have in mind, or sort of an analysis of coercion. Um, so, so one kind of important issue in thinking about uh, the understanding of coercion uh, is whether or not we can understand coercion, what makes uh, a line of action or a policy coercive without appealing to moral ideas, okay? So you might say, what does that mean? Well, the idea would be, you know, does coercion have to be just sort of unjust use of force or immoral or unjustified use of force? Or can we understand coercion in a way that doesn't presuppose its moral status, whether it's good or bad, uh, whether it's just or unjust? Um, one of the, uh, a professor at Georgia State, uh, Bill Edmondson, um, one of his, one, he wrote a very influential uh, you know, a book called Three Anarchical Fallacies. And one of them was, was arguing from a moralized version of coercion that's not that law is not typically coercive, okay? So, so that's sort of one kind of view, but that, I'm sort of putting that view to the side for the moment, not because I think Bill Edmondson's necessarily wrong, but just, just I wanna focus on a different way of thinking about coercion. Um, and that is one in which uh, we understand sort of in a non-moralized way, it's just a certain sort of technique right, for getting people on board, okay? Um, so the idea is that coercion is just sort of this, uh, is, is a technique by which um, uh, people are provided with motivation for compliance with some set of legal norms, okay? So the idea is that coercion uh, on this understanding, using this very specific notion, is what law does, or one of the things that law does in order to get people to do uh, what law uh, wants it to do, okay? So here's Ken Hema, uh, and um, and Hema has been, work, work has been, uh, working recently on this issue of law and coercion. We'll return to his ideas uh, a little bit later. But um, I'm, I'm gonna use something like his notion here. So, so in his view, uh, he connects the notion of coercion in this sense with the idea of sanctions, okay? So something counts as a coercive sanction if he says it's reasonably contrived to deter and punish non-compliance with some norm, okay? So the idea is that, uh, is that coercive sanctions in this sense um, have their role in virtue of, um, you know, being aiming at or being built to motivate people, right, to act in certain ways, right, to prevent non-compliance or to put it the more positive way, uh, to encourage compliance with legal norms, all right? So um, you might think, you know, if there's a, if there's, if I'm trying to get somebody to do something, there are all sorts of ways to try to do it. I could try to argue that it's a good idea or that God wants them to do it 
or um, that it will um, that it will make people like them if they do it. Or right, you could say that um, you could you could I could uh, tell them that if they don't do it, I'm going to visit some harm upon them. <laughs> okay, um, and that's you say, oh, okay, we sort of we know what that is. That, that's visiting a, a, a sanction upon someone. That's the sense of coercion uh, that we've got in mind here. And that's the that's the notion that's a notion of coercion that does seem to be. Um, rife within legal systems. Okay, if you if I said start late naming examples of legal systems, um, all the legal systems that you're going to name for me, right, are legal systems uh, in which coercion is exercised in some way uh, in order to generate in in order to generate compliance uh, with its norms. Okay, so so this is a super 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 frequent um, super frequent um, feature of legal systems, and and so here's our, so with that sort of understanding of it of of coercion sort of on the table, we're sort of going to be making use of that. Um, uh, I want to sort of raise three questions that we're going to talk about today. One is uh, I want to start by talking about what we might call some extreme views, right, on the issue of law and coercion. Um, it strikes me that the most um, it strikes me that the most prominent positions uh, out there on uh, the connection between law and coercion are extreme positions. Okay, um, so I want to talk about sort of what these extreme positions are. Um, in part, I'm going to be Sort of going over a little bit some of the some of the ground that you've gone over in looking at the philosophy of law book this semester. Um, so so I, I I'm assuming that, that maybe 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 the details of Austin's and Hart's legal theories aren't as firmly imprinted uh, on our brains as unfortunately they are on mine. Um, so so we'll go over that a little bit, but not with the aim of sort of just diving back into the depths of their theory so much as just try to think about what their views entail or what they suggest about the connection between law and coercion. Okay. So first off, I'm going to talk about these views and sort of and how sort of interestingly sort of how they sort of separate into a couple of sort of extreme positions. Second, um, I want to try to, um, I want to ask whether we can articulate a middle way on law and coercion that has some attractions, okay? So um, I'm, you know, again, sort of depending on how time goes and, and how um, discussion is going to work out in this format, um, I'm going to be asking y'all for, for, um, for some some middle way possibilities that one might um, that one might uh, one might offer on the connection between law and coercion, uh, and we'll talk about Ken Hema's own view, uh, which is itself a kind of middle way, right? And finally, though, um, I want to I want to I want to give an argument for one might think that an extreme position is in fact the correct position. Okay, you know, I myself accept an extreme view uh, on the relationship between law and coercion, uh, and I want to talk about sort of why, even in the face of the attractions of a middle way, I think the extreme an extreme view is the one to take. Um, so. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll keep in the back. I'll, I'll keep hidden here what, what extreme view I want y'all to defend um, for just a minute. Okay. All right. So, um, so I want to start by um, I said just you know talking about these extreme views, and, and in doing so, we're, we're going to kind of rehash a little bit um, of the uh, of the of the legal theory that you looked at at the very beginning of the philosophy of law tax. So, um, so, uh, so when people present um, you know a, a view of the nature of law called legal positivism, they almost always start with John Austin, uh, who is a pioneer uh, of legal theory. There's a picture, um, uh, I think, yeah, maybe of Austin. Um, so uh, in his in his in his grizzled old Old age. Um, anyway, uh, Austin, uh, pioneer in legal philosophy, um, his view held sway uh, for over a hundred years. Um, and uh, you know, though perhaps perhaps one of the most boring lectures in the history of, of philosophy, apparently he was the <laughs> he was the absolute worst. Um, if you you know if you uh, if you ever have had occasion to read Austin's actual uh, legal philosophy texts, they are pretty dry, uh, pretty and pretty extremely so. Um, but apparently his his lectures were basically early drafts of the those um, where he just sort of put his head down and just sort of mumbled his way through them. Um, and so of course people dropped his classes and eventually he got fired. Um, so anyway, so so uh, terrible lecture, nevertheless influential legal philosopher. Um, and uh, I want to sort of remind you of some basic um, aspects of Austin's view. This is in his uh, from from the from the classic text, Province of Jurisprudence Determined. So 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 Austin's theory uh, is is this is what's called a sovereign subject view of the nature of law. The idea is that um, what makes something a law, every individual legal norm, um, is a rule. Okay, uh, that sounds kind of plausible, and it's a rule that's laid down by a sovereign for that sovereign subjects. All right, I'm not going to spend much time talking about sort of what makes for sovereignty on. Austin's view doesn't really matter for our purposes today, uh, except the idea that, that a sovereign is supposed to be in some way a personal being made up of one or more persons, um, the kind of being that can have beliefs, desires, attitudes, and so forth. 
All right. Um, okay. And a rule, what makes a rule um, a, a rule is that it's a command. Okay. It's a command, uh, but it's of general form, right? So the idea that um, if I tell my child to go uh, clean her room, that's not a rule. Okay. That's just for some particular occasion. However, if I give her a general command, something like clean your room every Friday, um, that counts as a rule on Austin's view. And Austin says, well, yeah, sure. Uh, laws are the kind of things that are rules. Laws attempt to provide some sort of general guidance uh, for subjects. Um, so, so they can't just be individual commands. They have to be have this sort of rule like form. Okay, Whew. here's the big one. It's a long quote, right? Not not a quote, but a long definition. So on Austin's view, um, you know, he says that command is the key to jurisprudence, right? So the central concept of, of Austin's view is the notion of a command. And on Austin's view, um, and under, to, again to remind y'all, so uh, on Austin's view, what makes something a command is the fact that it's an expression of the commander's will that something be done. Okay, so a command gives voice to or expresses, right, somehow the desires or intentions of the commander that a subject act a certain way. Okay, so a command involves, um, again, like it, to take the case of the uh, of me and my child cleaning the rooms, like uh, what a command does is expresses my desire that the child clean uh, clean her room. But it's not just that, right? Because because I can give requests or just sort of you know express my desires without giving a command. Um, on Austin's view, what gets added to this uh, is the idea that. Um, in addition to that, if the if the person doesn't if the commanded does not comply, um, then the commander will visit some evil, okay, um, some <clears throat> some undesirable outcome upon the subject, okay, upon the person to whom the command has been given. All right. So, um, so that was makes something a command. It expresses a desire that the command to do something, and it also expresses an intention that one will visit an evil upon the commanded if they don't comply. All right, uh, and this is what um, and this is what makes for obligation on Austin's view. To be obligated uh, is just to be placed under a command by someone. Okay, now. And you can see sort of the, the structure of, of Austin's legal theory out of this, right? So, so on Austin's view, the idea is that, um, you know, what's involved with law uh, is that law consists of commands, general commands given by, um, given by a sovereign uh, to the sovereign's subjects. All right. So, and that's what that's what makes it the case that you're under legal obligations because you'll be have some evil visited upon you um, by uh, if you fail to comply. All right. Um, so given this, right, given this, um, if you say, hey, Austin, like, what's the right way to think about the connection between law and coercion, right? Um, it's not, it's not, you know, this isn't going to be the most demanding exam that you've been given. If, if you say, well, what do you, what, what should Austin say about the connection between law and coercion? Um, there's some subtleties you might, you might infuse into this, but, um, but one thing that's sort of obvious about this, right, is that the view sustains an extremely strong necessity thesis about law and coercion. All right, um, because after all, uh, you know what it says is it builds into the very idea, right, of a legal norm um, that it's a command, right, uh, and a command includes the idea that some evil will be visited upon the subject if the subject fails to comply. All right, so this view sustains a super, super strong necessity thesis about law and coercion, um, and in fact, you can just put it as this: necessarily, there's no legal norm that's not backed by a sanction, okay? I don't know why I did the double negative formulation here. Um, yeah, um, necessarily every legal norm is backed by a sanction, right? Um, because, all right, that's just part of the definition of command and, and law by definition consists of commands, all right? So, um, so Austin, right, sort of takes, um, on, so on one side, a, a kind of, we might think of as, as the most extreme, is it the most extreme? The most extreme possible view one could, I don't know, that's, that's right. And an a, a, a very extreme position on the connection between law and coercion, that is that every individual legal norm um, is the sort of thing, is, you know, has to involve um, coercion, okay? It's, it's backed by um, a coercive sanction um, by, uh, by the sovereign, okay? Um, so, uh, so on Austin's view, and you may have noticed that the, this, is, uh, this is one of the criticisms of, of Austin's view, is that on Austin's view, a lot of seeming laws turned out to count as not really laws on Austin's view. Okay, so and this is this is one of the objections to his position that a lot of things that seem like clear cases of laws, um, such as case, such as laws that um, that empower people to make more laws. Okay, what Hart calls we'll talk about Hart in a second power conferring laws. Um, it turns out since those those don't really count as laws at all in Austin's view, they're laws improperly so called or incomplete laws. Okay, um, and you know, and and you know what he's going to say about something like like uh, like international law, right? So if you have international law, um, where uh, especially in Austin's time, um, there was nothing like uh, nothing like centralized 
sanctions, um, he thought this was just foolishness. I mean, this is just not at all, um, not at all anything that, that appropriately goes by the name law. Why? Because there's no sort of, um, there's no commander um, uh, who can give, uh, who can attach sanctions uh, to the particular legal norms, right? So, inter so international law on his view was just sort of a misnomer, okay? All right, so, so that's Austin's view. And you can see sort of, so um, just sort of a reminder of the position, the idea is that, you know, given the position, you end up with a very strong view um, of, uh, of, uh, of the connection between law and coercion, all right? Now, you don't get much Austin these days, all right? So, um, so HLA Hart's 1961 concept of law is generally taken to have just laid to rest um, Austinian legal theory. As, you know, as philosophers go, there's always some holdouts or people who want to who wanna revive. Um, but, you know, as, as far as the consensus of legal theory goes, uh, you know, most legal theory done these days is in some way Hardian, okay? It's in some way inspired by or is derivative from Hart's position, okay? Um, so, uh, so this HLA Hart, um, picture of him, you know, uh, years after uh, the concept of law. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, you know, Hart, you know, basically argued that Austin was wrong in pretty much every way. Um, he's wrong on sovereignty. Uh, there's, there's not an identifiable sovereign in most legal systems. Okay. Um, he's wrong on laws command because, as we'll see on Hart's view, um, it's wrong to think of, of laws. I mean, the laws just don't have the features that commands have. They're not all datable. Um, they're not all um, telling you to act one way rather than another. Um, so there are all sorts of ways in which uh, even even paradigmatic laws uh, don't seem to fit the uh, fit the mold of commands. And he, and he thinks that. Austin was also you know, egregiously wrong about obligation. Um, that uh, these, you know, in one of the more famous lines of argument in concept of law, he argues that Austin confuses being obliged, right, where um, where uh, where you know to be obliged to do something is to is to be forced by someone who's imposing a sanction upon you. To contrast that with being obligated. Uh, where the idea is, to, is for one to be under an obligation uh, is for there to be others who are in some way authorized or entitled uh, to hold you accountable for various sorts of failure. Okay, um, so that's a very different sort of notion, of, very different notion of obligation. Uh, maybe there's like social pressure could be involved or whatever, but but it's not. There's there's nothing essential about the connection between law and sanctions, and sa pardon me, command and sanctions, and definitely sanctions aren't sufficient um, to make something uh, count as a command rather than just like a threat or something like that. Okay, so so this is why Hart said we need a fresh start uh, and, and, and sort of in, in our hearts view, the central concept of the central idea is that of a social rule. Okay, so this is going to be the quick primer on, on, on Hart's legal theory. So, um, so Hart thinks a social one way a social rule uh, exists um, is by by sort of use, right? It's by the standard a standard being used by people to whom it applies. So, um, with rules of etiquette, like rules of manners, um, mentally conduct, and rules of games, you don't need a commander for these rules to be in place, right? Rather, these rules exist because they're part of the practice of those. That are involved in, man, you know, uh, mannerly life, right? Or, or the rules of games, right? People, it's people who play games like poker, right? Um, who, in virtue of using the rules, make it the case that this is what counts as the rules of poker. All right, um, and you can have uh, social life, right? You can have social life that's governed just by rules of this sort, right? You might call them rules of custom. Hart hesitates to do that, but you might call them rules of custom. Uh, you could have a whole society that's governed just by rules in use, okay, the, the rules, the existence of which simply depend on the fact that people acknowledge them, practice them, use them to criticize their own and each other's behavior, okay. Hart's view is that even though this is true, right, you could have social rules like this, you don't really capture what's interesting about law simply by focusing on that kind of rule. Um, rather, and and, his, and, uh, and the reason why I'm going into this, I, I don't strictly need to ask, I want to use this later on in talking about um, stuff about coercion, um, is that Hart thinks that, uh, that by uh, you could sort of understand a little better what legal systems are like if you focus on what how bad or or sort of ways I shouldn't say how bad they would be uh, what would be missing uh, in social life if, if we uh, if we only had rules um, that were generated in this way okay so he says imagine imagine a system that has only primary rules okay um, imagine uh, you know, sort of imagine a society um, that's simply governed by rules that exist in virtue of being used. Right by the people in that society, um, and these rules just sort of tell people to act one way rather than another. Maybe they tell you to refrain from certain sorts of negative conduct, harmful conduct. Maybe they direct you to be helpful in certain ways, and so forth. Right? Doesn't really matter. Um, all, so this is what Hart calls primary uh, primary rules. He says, "Well, what what difficulties would a society face if it was regulated only by primary rules?" Well, um, so here's what he says. Uh, you know, he says, "Look, um, you know, these rules will be uncertain, static, and inefficient." 
Okay, uh, well, what does he mean by that? Uh, the labels I don't think are, are all that helpful. Um, they're uncertain in that there's an awful lot of vagueness about the existence and content of those rules, right? Why? Well, it's because something like this is because, um, you know, if they exist only in virtue of being practiced, in virtue of being used, okay, then it's unclear sort of, well, how many people have to use it in order for it to count as a rule? What exactly is the content of the rule being used? How can you detect that from people's behavior and so forth? Okay, so, so there's uncertainty in sort of what the rules are within the system. That's sort of one sort of difficulty that arises. The second is um, that these rules are static. What's the noun form of being static, staticness? I don't know. Um, uh, if someone can come up with like the, uh, the, the right, you know, um, you know, noun form of this, put it in the in chat or whatever, we'll, we'll figure it out, right? So, um, so, uh, so uh, the problem is that these, you can't introduce deliberate change into these rules. You can't just change, um, uh, even, even if society wanted to, it will, it can't change uh, what the rules of society are in any deliberate way, right? You just kind of have to wait for people's attitudes to change sufficiently. You can make arguments and so forth, right? Um, but notice that, that there's no sort of way of like flipping the switch, right? Uh, to change the society from being under one rule to being under another rule, right? Because it just depends depends on a diffuse habit of, of acceptance, right, by a lot of the people in that society. And finally, he says it's inefficient. Um, and, and the inefficiency that he focuses on there is interesting. The one he focuses on is uncertainty and disagreement about how the rules should be applied, right? So, um, so, uh, so thoughts like, you know, one worry that people have is that, well, if you want to hold somebody responsible, right, for, for failing to act in accordance with the rule, um, or you even want to hold yourself responsible if you've, in fact, um, violated the rule, there's no, you might, think, you might call, official take, right, about whether a rule uh, has been violated. And that's what that's the way what Hart takes to be sort of crucial um, to the distinctive aspects of a legal order, right? That uh, that a legal order includes secondary rules, rules about rules, right? Um, uh, and uh, and uh, and that's I said that's what that's what Hart takes to be sort of um, interesting, right? That that one way that rules can come into existence is that a rule, right, can tell you you know, when a rule's in existence, right? Um, how to make new rules uh, and who has, who's authorized to apply the rules, okay? That's the, and that's the, what Hart takes to be the distinctive, um, uh, you know, uh, difference making feature with respect to a society uh, with simply primary rules and a society that has a legal order, okay? So he says laws, he calls it laws, a union of primary uh, and secondary rules. Um, and that's why he, th and he thinks that this sort of remedies, right, um, are, are, serves as remedies to all these faults, um, that it's a remedy to uncertainty, right? Because a, you can have a rule of recognition, right? This is the big uh, innovation in, Hart, in Hart's legal theory. A rule of recognition states what counts as a rule within that system, right? So Hart's thesis is that within every legal system, there's a rule of recognition accepted by officials that specifies what counts uh, as, rule, at the, as the legal rules within that system, okay? So in Great Britain or in the United States or in Uruguay or in Australia or in Sierra Leone, or there, whatever, right? Whatever the legal system is, um, there's a rule of recognition in that system uh, that specifies what counts as the legal norms of that system. That's the, that's the remedy to uncertainty. And, and legal systems will also include other secondary rules, rules of change that enable you to introduce or subtract rules from the system. Uh, we'll also have rules that tell you um, who's authorized to make judgments um, about how the law is to be applied, right? So official judges, right? Rather than, uh, rather than um, so simply everybody deciding for themselves. Okay, so 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 this takes us to the so it's hard. This is the quick and dirty summary. So on Hart's view, in, to be law is in part to be either the rule of recognition of some legal system he calls the rule of recognition law, um, or to be one of the rules validated by way of that rule of recognition. Okay, that's the sort of the big. Uh, and I said this is the this is the um, and to be under a legal obligation is just to be bound by a legal rule for there to be a rule of that system um, that uh, that uh, that. Uh, um, that uh, that requires you right to act one way uh, rather than another. Okay. Now, like I said, it strikes me that um, nearly everybody in legal philosophy now, whether they're a legal positivist or natural law theorist, you may have encountered those notions before. Um, they all sort of work kind of within Hart's scheme. Okay. Um, because the you know the idea of the rule of recognition uh, as an innovation that sort of helps us to recognize what's distinctive about legal systems was really really broadly taken up uh, within legal philosophy. Okay. Okay. Enough of this. Stuff. Now back to back to the this, our central question, which is coercion. Okay. Um, remember the idea is like okay, so you look at Austin's view, and it's obvious sort of what one should say about the connection between law and coercion in this view, right? It's this necessary feature. Every legal norm um, has to have some coercive element to it, a sanction to it, right? Um, but then, like the question becomes, well, what should Hart say? 
right? Um, if you take this, if you, if you um, sort of overthrow the Austinian position, right, and understand that legal norms are to be understood in this sort of primary rule, secondary rule way, right? There's got to be a rule of recognition, right? The rule of recognition, you know, all legal validity flows down from that rule, okay? And all it is to be a rule is just to be validated by the rule of recognition. Um, what should we say about the connection between law and sanctions? Okay. What should we say about, um, about whether a legal system or individual laws have a kind of necessary connection to coercion? Okay. So pause for that, sort of, you know, think about it for a second. What should one say about this? Well, um, on the face of it, I mean, just note, just, just again, sort of start with the, the, just how it looks, right? Um, take Austin's view, sanctions are right there front and center, okay? On Hart's view, Sanctions are nowhere to be seen in the in the in the facial structure of the theory. Okay, if you're going to make it uh, kind of if you want to try to make a claim that there's some kind of necessary connection, right? What you need to do is you're going to have to start digging around and sort of try to generate one, right, out of the materials that Hart has given us. Um, but that's not the direction that Hart goes. All right, the direction that Hart goes um, is to say, well, um, yeah, it looks like there's a simply it's a simply a contingent matter whether a legal system employs sanctions. And in fact, this is the speculation that Hart confirms um, in his discussion of international law in the concept of law, okay? So, um, so, uh, so you know, here's, here's, a, here's a big quote. Uh, this is Hart on law and coercion. So, um, so one of the chapters laid in, in the book, The Concept of Law, is a discussion of international law and whether, you know, so, so Hart's kind of subtle, right? I mean, he, he doesn't say, he doesn't think that we have to answer the question just by saying, yes, it is, or no, it isn't, right? Um, he's perfectly happy to say things like, well, there are ways in which it resembles a paradigmatic legal system. Um, there are ways in which it doesn't, <laughs> okay? Um, if you want to know Hart's view, for the most part, he thinks it looks kind of like a legal system. There's no reason in principle why we would, why we would simply deny that international law is law. Okay, um, you know, international law had had changed by the time Hart was writing. Uh, Hart, you know, Hart um, still thought, you know, you know, you know, there were in fact some sort of central, more centralized courts, um, and uh, and uh, more centralized courts, and um, and uh, what's the what's the other word? Um, and sanctions sort of attached to various ways, uh, at least on paper, sanctions attached. Um, but Hart, uh, but Hart thought that 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 the sanctions that that uh, the international law provided for at his time, he thought they were they were basically paper only. He didn't think they were they were particularly uh, important. Um, but but here's so here's one of his remarks about the connection between law and coercion. The basic thought is that if you want to say that international law is not law, don't say that just because it's not coercive, right? Or just because you think it doesn't have effective sanctions tied to it, right? Um, so here's the argument says, to argue that international law is not binding because of its lack of organized sanctions. He says, is tacitly to accept the analysis of obligation contained in the theory that the law is essentially a matter of orders backed by threats, okay? And that's Austin's view, right? You know, so, so that's, how, that's how Hart characterizes the Austinian position. He says, yet this identification distorts the role played in all legal thought and discourse of the ideas of obligation and duty. Okay, so so Hart's here sort of confirming the idea that once you sort of go his direction, he confirming the view that once you go his direction rather than Austin's, he thinks you know once you've given up the idea of commands as um, orders backed by threats, and you give up the idea that to be obligated right just involves right being threatened in a certain way, he thinks you know no there's no reason to think that a legal order has to involve sanctions at all. Okay, um, and that's why, and that's sort of, and that's his justification for saying that even if, um, even if you want to deny the title of international of law to international law, don't do that um, just because it lacks sanctions. He thinks that's not a good reason. Uh, that's not a good reason for denying it. Okay, so Hart's remarks are sort of, um, I said, you kind of have to dig a little to, to get Hart's considered take on this in the concept of law. Um, later, uh, later people who, uh, later philosophers who. Um, you know, who are following Hart, right? Even if modifying his views in various ways, um, you know, confirmed, uh, you know, and 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 deepened this view, right? So I'm sorry, there's a huge long line of text, but if, if you're interested in this, I know this is being recorded, so you can go back and look at it. So so this is Joseph Raz, um, and Raz is a uh, fantastic uh, legal philosopher. So so Raz, you know, raises the question in this passage, right? Uh, in his book, Practical Reason and Norms, he says, is it possible for there to be a legal system in force which does not provide for sanctions? Okay, he says, the answer, he says, you gotta be careful what he says here. The answer is that it seems it is humanly impossible, but logically but logically possible. Okay. He says it's humanly impossible because 
human beings as they are in support, uh, the support of sanctions to be enforced by law is necessary. Okay, um, and yet we can imagine other rational beings, right, who are subject to law, who have and who would acknowledge that they have more than enough reasons to obey the law, regardless of sanctions. If such a normative system has all the other features of a legal system, it would be recognized by one by all, despite the lack of sanctions, right? So, so here's Raz giving an explicit argument, which we're going to be talking about a little bit. So, um, so as I, I call it the angels argument because Raz, you know, starts talking about these rational, other rational beings, calling them angels. He says, you know, angels might not need a legal system. Pardon me, might not need sanctions. Um, they might not, because they might be thoroughly more motivated to do what the law tells them to do, even if there were no sanctions attached to it, right? So I says, well, case closed, okay? Um, and this would also be true of, if, of human beings if we were massively transformed, right? If we became beings who didn't need um, as much movement by sanctions, all right, um, then, uh, then it would be possible for us to be under a legal system, to have all the features of, of a hardy and legal system, right? Primary, secondary rule, union, right? Rule of recognition, all that good stuff, um, even without having sanctions involved in it at all. All right, and so that's why 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 Raz sort of taking up Hart's mantle says, oh yeah, the connection between law and coercion is just contingent. It's a matter of how we humans right now happen to be psychologically constituted. Okay, unless you think that this is just like oh, this is just a just a, like a strand of of weirdness sort of happening within you know Anglo uh, you know English legal philosophy um, in the in the late 20th century. Um, so you get the same kind of argument in in Aquinas. Okay, so um, so here's a here's a here's a portrayal of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so again, if you've read the Philosophy of Law chapter on you know um, you, I talk about his theory, his natural law theory. And so Aquinas says in the in the view that um, you know that's you know, much repeated. So law is an ordinance of reason for the common good made by one who has care of the community, that is the right authority, uh, and promulgated, that is made public. Okay, uh, This shows up in, in Aquinas' text, Summa Theologiae. And sort of one thing you could sort of see looking at that is, that, again, like Hart's view, right? You look at it and you say, I don't see anything about sanctions there. <laughs> okay, I don't see anything about coercion. It looks like it's perfectly possible, perfectly coherent, right? Um, on a view like Aquinas's to hold that there's law in place, but there to be no coercion attached to it. Okay, um, and this I think is if this is this is confirmed by an argument that Aquinas gives. That's a precursor uh, of of Raz's angels argument. So 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 um, so here's a point. Aquinas had it first. Okay, um, so uh, I'll, I'll just say this real quick. So so there's this interesting um, tradition in uh, in uh, in uh, in the universities where Aquinas worked of having um, disputed questions. And one thing that everybody had to do, who was um, who was being certified to teach, was they had to do commentaries on this on the on what's called the sentences of Peter Lombard. Again, you don't get a lot of Peter Lombard these days, so you get a lot of Aquinas. Anyway, um, one of the one of the main questions they had to comment on was: Would there have been political authority in the state of innocence? Okay, state of innocence is on this view. What if Adam and Eve had never sinned, right? And humans had never fallen. Um, if humans had remained good and sinless and virtuous, right? Would there have been political authority? Right? Or is political authority simply something that happens because human beings are not so fantastic? Right? Is that the so, so again? I, I hope you can see the connection between this and Raz's angels argument. And Aquinas answers yes, there would have been political authority. It wouldn't have been coercive. You wouldn't have need to have political authority in place to get people by threat um, to act one way rather than another. Nevertheless, um, you would have political authority of the sort that authoritatively directs multitudes to the common good. Okay, that tells bunches of people how to coordinate um, so that the common good of the community can be realized. Okay, uh, he says, "Oh, you'd still need that, right? Because because angels aren't going to naturally—I mean, not angels. Even good human beings aren't going to sort of naturally be able to coordinate with each other in the in the optimal way. Um, you need authority for that." Uh, but uh, his thought is that, well, um, if all these features are realized, that's you know. That's what makes for law, okay? What makes for law is just that there be an authority that lays down general rules uh, for the common good. Um, and so, so even Aquinas, right? Aquinas also affirms this sort of no law and coercion position, okay? Okay, I don't know about y'all, but you know, it, when 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 uh, when, uh, when you get to this point in sort of the discussion, I my response is sort of a wait what right? Um, because look at the positions that was, have sort of been put on the table in front of us, right? One position is, Every individual legal norm necessarily involves a sanction. 
wow, super strong, right? Extremely strong position, right? Um, on on uh, on the connection between law and sanctions. So here's another one, right? So here's the here's the alternative that we've we've looked at. There can be entire legal systems, right, that do not have any sanctions involved. Sanctions are an entirely contingent feature of law. Okay. Um, so one question that one might raise here is: Is it possible to articulate a sensible middle position? Right? Is it possible to have a view, right, um, on which, <laughs> you know, on which there's some connection between law and, um, you know, between law and sanction and law and coercion? Um, that's some kind of necessary connection, but maybe not as strong as the one that Austin presents. Okay, um, I was, you know, looking at the clock, I'm sort of wondering whether. We, um, well, let me ask. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if we, do y'all have any ideas about this. So, 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 what kind of position one might one articulate about the connection between? Um, between is it something sort of in between uh, the kind of the, the 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 extremity of Austin's view and the position that Hart and Raz takes. Hart, Raz, and Austin. Pardon me, Aquinas. Any suggestions? Is there any middle room here, or is, or have they described sort of the only sort of the only sort of real possibilities that one might take on this? I'll make one suggestion. Sure. Uh, and me and me here looks like he might have a potential middle here, but here's one suggestion: it's it's not a sanction that's necessarily a connection, but the threat of a sanction. Yeah. Good. Uh, whether or not there is really a sanction present. Right, awesome. So, so one thing you could have here, so, and, and, and this, I'll just sort of say, this is something that, uh, that if I were less sloppy, I could have made this, that, that in, in part sort of what they're, what they're, I mean, they're not so much concerned about the idea that, I mean, that, that I should put this way, even the, the Hart, Raz, and Aquinas position, um, I want to say, it's not just that they're denying that there's necessarily actually sanctions used, but also, also that, I mean, given the sort of argument that they offer, you wouldn't even need a threat of sanction Either right, but but I, I agree with you that you, you might think that you might think the one kind of one kind of distinction you might make is a distinction between um, well maybe every system necessarily authorizes sanctions even if not every system necessarily uses it right that's one kind of possibility that's really good others are there others out there thanks for that anyone yeah. all these suggestions about sort of how one might go here I mean let me let me let me let me throw out an idea and see what so so Austin says Austin's view is that every individual legal norm has to have a sanction. I mean, think about how strong that is, y'all. It's, it's basically, for every individual law, there has to be a sanction attached to it, right? Hart, Raz, and Aquinas say, um, Hart, Raz, and Aquinas say, uh, well, you don't even have to have, your, you could have a whole system that has no sanctions in it at all, right? So one way of thinking about it is, Austin's view is about individual legal norms, and Aquinas's view Hearts at Raz and Quas are about like whole systems, right? So, so one thing you might say is like, well, maybe something like this. You know, maybe um, every legal system has to have norms in, has to have sanctions in some way, right? Or has to authorize sanctions in some way, but maybe not every individual legal norm <laughs> has to have one, right? I mean, you know, you could you could have sort of this in between view. It's like, well, maybe um, maybe somehow sanctions are are a necessary feature of legal systems, but not necessarily of every individual legal norm, right? That's one kind of possibility. Um, there could be others as well, right? So Christopher, you know, maybe you could say that maybe that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that every system has to have sanctions at some particular level, right? Or something like that. Um, or maybe you might, you might use it, you might have a, you might use a technique like Aquinas, like some of the natural law theorists do to say, well, a system with that legal system, legal sanctions is defective, even if it's possibly, even if it possibly exists. Right, that could be a way one might go. Um, in any case, right, there's sort of there. You know, one thing you might wonder about sort of whether these sort of, what, what the sort of the middle possibilities are and what kinds of arguments one might give for them. Um, we're going to explore one of these. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to so um, so uh, so we have stories sort of wor worry that whether there is one. I'm I'm hope I'm what you could ask, try to figure out whether or not this actually it actually is a middle way. Right. So here's Ken Hema again. Hema's view is that maybe some legal norms are not backed by sanctions, but his thought is that there's something bizarre. He thinks it's bizarre to think that something as ubiquitous, that is as ever, you know, as you know, you see it everywhere, right? Um, as ubiquitous and salient, right? So it's not just that it's everywhere, but it's such a prominent feature of legal systems, right? Um, that it, he thinks it's weird to think that could just be a merely a contingent feature of legal systems. Okay. He says, why would you think that, right? Why, why you know, if everywhere we look at legal systems, we find coercion being used, 
why would we think that's not a necessary feature of legal systems? Okay, and that's and this is the thesis that I was proposing. He he thinks that that sanctions are a necessary feature of legal systems, though not of every individual legal norm. Right? He says, he says, what do I know? Right? You know, maybe there's some legal norms that don't have sanctions attached to them. Right? He thinks that's actually true. Um, but what he says, but we can be much more confident about whole legal systems, right? Um, given the fact that we're that all the legal systems we're familiar with have this feature, right? So, so this is what he calls the coercion thesis. He says it's a necessary feature, uh, necessary feature of any legal system that includes what norms authorizing the judicial imposition. This is like um, uh, Professor Cohen's view. He said, well, maybe not used but threatened, right? So Hema says they have to at least authorize right, the judicial imposition of sanctions as a formal response to noncompliance, both to court orders, okay, so basically you need sanctions to tell people to show up in court when the judge tells you, right, or to do what the judge says when the judge says, um, you know, you know, desegregate it with all deliberate speed, you need to have force to be able to, to, to get behind that, um, and um, and some mandatory legal directives involving non-official non action, right, so so things that tell you no jaywalking or whatever or, you know, or no murder, right, you, there has to be some sorts of sanctions um, uh, that, that, uh, that discourage um, uh, that conduct uh, that's not that's that's not official. Okay, that doesn't involve the courts at all, but just ordinary behavior in the way we're treating each other. Okay, um, so that's Hema's thesis, and I, I think it's important to sort of think about this as like as a, as a possible middle road, um, and uh, think about the arguments that he offers for it. So, so what's like the initial case for this, right? So, so, um, so. Uh, so Hima's book, I should say, Hima's book is big and complicated. Uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to try to like, I think I'm, I'm like trying to capture here what I take to be sort of the central line of argument. The central line of argument has to do with the human centeredness of the concept of law. And everybody kind of admits this. Everyone says, oh yeah, you know, law is a human institution. Uh, our concept of law derives um, from the fact that it's an institution that meets human needs in a human context and so forth, right? Um, and so everyone sort of agrees to that. Sort of Raz agrees to that. Um, Hart agrees to that. Um, Aquinas, maybe. I don't know. Aquinas has a big theory of law that sort of involves God too. But, but so still, at the very least, like Hart and, and, uh, and Raz and Hema all sort of agree on this, um, on this human center. What they disagree about is whether or not it extends beyond like the ordinary conditions of human life, which require sanctions to, um, to other conditions of other rational beings or us super improved, okay? Um, so here's Hema's argument. We'll sort of see what the force is. Like law is an artifact, right? Contrived to meet human needs. And because it's an artifact contrived to meet human needs, it sort of takes for granted human agency as we actually find it, okay? Um, and uh, given that fact, like the best account, right? The best account of why sanctions are everywhere everywhere we, what we would count as a legal system is that it's part of the proper functioning of law um, uh, to employ sanctions to realize social order, okay? So Hema has this sort of functionalist view about what law's nature consists in. Um, we sort of look, well, what is law actually doing? What is its actual function? What ends is it serving? How is it, ex what activities is it engaging in to realize those ends? Um, that's what, Hema, what makes Hema think. He says, well, isn't it just sort of obvious that the central activity that law employs um, is involves uh, sanctions. Okay, doesn't that give us some reason to think um, that law involves sanctions? Sorry about the long sentence here, um, but so so he's, so his thought is that uh, to sort of analyze or respond to the the Raz and Aquinas arguments, saying so 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 even if they're societies of angels or pre-fallen humans, right, or post-transformed humans so after the Marxist revolution or whatever, right, um, you know, who don't need sanctions. Right? Maybe they don't need sanctions, right? Um, you know, that doesn't mean that they have law without sanctions. It just means they don't need and so don't have a legal order. Okay? Um, law necessarily involves sanctions in some way on Hema's view. So what you've described, Raz and Aquinas, what you described are non-legal orders. You describe ways in which people can get by without law, at least so long as they're massively, uh, you know, as, as long as these beings are massively different uh, from our own. Okay? All right. So, um, in order to talk about this, sort of try to get at what um, is at issue between Hema and um, and, uh, and 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 Hema's rivals, um, I think it's worth sort of talking a little bit about like functional attribution and how it works. Um, so, so, it's like, so, uh, so since Hema's ideas sort of depend on ideas of function, right, about sort of what the function of law is, right? Um, you know, in order to figure out what a, what the function of something is. Uh, what's sort of essential to beings of, of a certain function, right? You look at the ends that it serves, that is the outcomes that it tries to promote, right? So you might think that everything with a function is trying to bring something about, 
Okay, a vacuum cleaner or a to you know, vacuum cleaner is bringing about a dirtless floor, or a toaster is bringing about toasted bread or whatever. Okay, um, part of what it is to have a function is that it ends serves certain ends. Okay, the second thing you look at are the activities by which it realizes those ends. Okay, so a vacuum cleaner does it by generating suction, taking the dirt off the off the floor. A toaster does it by heating up the coils, and that's what toasts the bread. Those, that's like how a toaster works, right? That's part of the functioning of a toaster, um, and that it ha that it carries out those activities in order to realize those ends okay so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna to dwell on that fact but 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 the idea is that basically idea is that the reason why a toaster is built the way it is okay why it has those coils that glow when you plug it in and you push the lever is in order to make the bread brown and crispy and toast i could go for some toast right now not that I think. anyway so um i'm making the toast sound really good um so anyway so that's the way when, when you ascribe a function of something that's how you go about doing it right so think about hearts right i give another example it's like a heart the aim, the aim of a heart or the end of a heart is to circulate the blood Okay, um, but it's really crucial that that hearts do it in a, in a distinctive way by pumping. Okay, there's a, if so if you want to identify a heart, right, in some biological species you never encountered before, you say does it have a heart? You look to see whether its blood is circulating, what's making the blood circulate, and you look to see that it's done by by um, by uh, by pumping. Okay, if there are weird weird circular beings that that basically circulated the blood by just like rolling over and over again, so the blood sinks to the lowest level. Okay, um, that they wouldn't have hearts. Okay, even though they generate circulation of blood, because because hearts carry out their activity uh, in sort of a distinctive way. All right, so so the way that that um, that Hema is thinking about it is like he says, well, look, um, the end of law is social order. And that's realized by, and this is the Hardian point, by a distinctive technique of providing social rules, okay? And again, Hart would agree with this, which subjects are generally motivated, sufficiently motivated to comply with, all right? So it's like they're, you know, that's part of what involved in legal systems that subjects will characteristically go along uh, to, some, to some appropriate extent with what the law says. And finally, he says, what's more, the distinctive feet function of law involves, right, um, they, they're sufficiently motivated because the system authorizes sanctions for non-compliance. That's just part of how law does what it does, right? That's part of how law you know, exercises its capacities. That's, that's part of, you know, just, just, it's just a, a toaster makes bread by, you know, by, by, by heating up those coils. Law generates sufficient compliance with, with its norms um, by authorizing sanctions. And so he thinks that's why we should look at the idea of law without sanctions as just sort of a contradiction in terms. It's like saying, well, a heart that's not a, a law without sanctions it's like a heart that's not an object that's not, that's not trying to pump blood, right? It's just not a, not a heart, okay? So again, sort of another way of thinking about this is like, if you go back to Hart's list where he says, oh, you know, what are we missing when we just have primary rules? He says, well, we have uncertainty and staticness and inefficiency. Uh, Hema would say, well, here's another thing. We also have inadequate motivation for compliance, all right? Because of the kind of thing that humans are. Um, and, so, uh, and so the upshot of that is that, you know, uh, one of the things that law does uh, is by, uh, is providing is providing um, something like um, you know something like uh, uh, coercion uh, in order to um, to generate the right results. Okay, don't worry. Um, so 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 I'm just want to try to emphasize sort of the similarity between these views. So so Hema and like the no necessary coercion view of of Aquinas and Hart and Raz, they agree with a bunch of stuff except for this last bit. Okay, you know Hema thinks that you have to analyze law in terms of all of these features. Okay, whereas the no necessary coercion view says it's only these features that matter, okay? Um, and that's right, and that's, and that's the view, right? So the, so, um, so the view is like uh, the, the no necessary coercion view, yeah, they can take on a kind of a functionalist understanding. They just think that it, the function of law doesn't involve um, the authorization and, and imposition of sanctions. Um, uh, that's just no part of what it is for something to be law. Right, I think when you I think when you put it this way, I, I you know I, I really think that makes Hema's view look kind of attractive, right? Because it actually puts kind of a burden on the on the no necessary coercion view, right? Um, you might want to say like, looks like, well, why are sanctions right, uh, which show up in um, why are sanctions which show up in all of our actual clear cases of law and have a central role in enabling law to carry out its central activity, right? Why is it not to be considered part of law's nature? Okay, um, so Christopher points out this kind of an Occam's razor thing sort of going on here, right? You, you know, um, you know, so so um, Hema thinks that this Occam's razor thing is like um, you know, the most the most um, theoretically adequate way to incorporate the fact that law shows up in all these places. Given the fact this is the easiest way to generate this kind of compliance, Shane's right. It's a powerful motivator, right? Um, it's like, well, obviously law is designed to do this. Okay, it's designed um, to generate compliance and 
And it, it, when you design something, you take to, into account the normal environment. The normal environment are people who need um, who need um, motivation by sanctions in order for there to be adequate compliance. Um, so I, I hope I hope you all are sort of feeling the view. Like, I don't actually accept this view, right? But I kind of feel it because like, oh yeah, that's actually a damn good argument, Hema. Um, it's like you know, you know, on his view, um, you know, to say that there's law without without use of sanctions is like saying that there are hearts that don't move blood by pumping. Right? He says it's such a distinctive aspect of laws of hearts activity, right? And not not the philosopher, but actually the, the bodily organ, right? Um, that they that they engage in pumping to bring about its end result, right? Um, why wouldn't we want to say this about law as well? All right. So I think that's kind of the challenge. Um, you know, so um, sh you know, this is Fred Schauer who who defended uh, uh, much earlier, um, like 10, 15 years before Hema, defended a, a kind of version of Hema's view, that, though not without, in my view, um, without nearly the force and sophistication of Hema's position there. You know? So, um, but Shower just says, look, this is this is legal philosophers behaving badly, <laughs> right? He says, you know, legal philosophers, you know, they abstract stuff and they've abstracted away the most salient feature of the legal order. And that is the fact that there are people with guns and courts who are willing to punish you. It's like, you know, how can you how can you think that you're giving an adequate account of laws and nature unless you bring out um, that feature? Okay, so that's from his book, The Force of Law. Um, but notice, so one thing, and I'm not going to have time to get into this, but one thing that people have challenged um, is um, is is the claim um, that Showers made that that basically everybody obeys the law primarily due to sanctions, right? So so even if it's a powerful motivator, um, you might want to look at this if you're in, if you're into this view. It's like um, there's a book by Thomas Tyler, Tom Tyler, called Why People Obey the Law. It actually gives a lot of so social scientific evidence of how much compliance is a result of judgments of legitimacy rather than sanctions okay but anyway um the fact the fact that, that laws need sanction is not really for what's what's up to debate uh, among these folks i'm just gonna let that point slide on by here anyway okay so this is me um now and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna try to talk back a little bit to Hema, and i'm just gonna try to give like the sketch of an argument for why i'm not convinced by Hema's sort of argument okay so so i don't think um i don't think the rejection of um I don't think the rejection of the view that law requires sanctions. I don't think it's legal philosophers behaving badly. Okay, I think it can be. I mean, you, people can hold views for all sorts of silly reasons, but I don't think it has to be. I think there's. I think there's a kind of argument for why we wouldn't, why we shouldn't include sanctions or coercive sanctions in the definition or analysis of law, and it doesn't involve simply sort of illegitimate abstraction or ignoring the fact that legal that legal societies um, uh, that, that that legal systems um, must have. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. It doesn't involve sort of ignoring a plain fact on the ground or overlooking it or abstracting away from it. Okay, uh, sorry. Here's here's again one of these sort of long sentences. Um, so so I don't think I don't I, I think that that the reason why we should deny that sanctions are essential to law is not because we're paying inadequate attention to facts on the ground about the world and how how sanctions work. I think it's just by paying closer attention to relevant differences between activities that law carries out. OK, I think I think we need to be I think we need to be more careful about reasons why something can be um, extraordinarily common in a system. Right. Sometimes these reasons involve um, because they're essential to the function of a thing. Sometimes they don't. OK, and, and, and I, I want to give sort of an explanation of sort of why we might uh, why we might think. Think this. OK. So here's an important difference, okay? Um, suppose you've, again, sort of like you're, 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 you're trying to understand the function of something, right? A heart or a toaster or a vacuum cleaner um, or, or, um, or a social, you know, or, a, or, a, or, a, or some sort of social custom or whatever, right? Um, you might distinguish between two things, right? You might, you know, I mean, so, so you have a bunch of examples of it and they all have a bunch of features in common, right? And they all, they're all doing, you know, Various activities, right? Um, they also, again, they sort of all have that in common. One thing you could distinguish between is, that, is an activity that they carry out in order to realize some end, okay? And that is like what they're supposed to do, right? Absolutely, like like the heart's supposed to pump blood, um, a toaster is supposed to toast bread, right? Um, a vacuum cleaner is supposed to suck up dirt and all that. Right? So there are various things that they're just supposed to do. That's just and and the reason why all of these examples are designed to carry out that activity is, is just because it's part of their function, okay? But here's another reason why things, why, why an activity might be common in some artifact, some examples of artifacts, right? It might be because, um, because we're not very good at making that kind of artifact. And so we have to rig up something to deal with malfunctions, 
Okay, it's like an extra module that we have in place in order to deal with the fact, right? In order to deal with the fact that malfunctions take place. Okay, so um, so suppose like so I have a toaster, right? And um, so I've, I have a toaster, and the problem is that my toaster doesn't do very well at regulating the heat. Um, you know, we're really really bad at making resistors, so right? So I have this extra module, right? That um, if the if the if the if the current gets too high, it's like a fail safe that will turn off the turn off the toaster for a little bit um, to save the whole thing from being fried and destroying our house's electrical system or whatever, right? I'm not good with electric electricity, so this may be a terrible example. Okay. Anyway, that is, it could be that we're just really, really bad at making toasters, and every one of these has this kind of fail-safe on it, right? Um, that uh, that enables it to sort of stop the the malfunctioning toaster from doing too much damage to save it for to toast bread another day. Okay. You wouldn't want to say, I want to say, that that is part of the function of a toaster, is to have that kind of fail-safe in it. Right. What you'd say is, yeah, given sort of how bad we are at making toasters, you kind of have to have a fail safe device like this in it. OK, but you wouldn't want to say that's part of what it is to be a toaster is that it has that kind of fail safe in it. All okay? right. Why wouldn't you want to say that? Because it conflates a difference between two kinds of activities that these toasters are carrying out. One is making the object that is the point of it to make. Right. And the other is um, to deal with defects in their parts or the design or something like that. Okay, those seem to me to be two very, very different, uh, di very different um, activities that, an, that a functional object can carry out. One is carrying out its actual function. The other is dealing with, right, and correcting the possibility of malfunctions in the parts. All right. Okay. Why does that matter? Okay. The reason why is this: is that look, it seems to me that what we what we should say, what we should say about legal systems, is um, not that sanctions are part of their function. OK, but rather they exist because things have gone wrong in the functioning of the legal system. They're more like the module that we attach to, to my toaster to keep it from frying, you know, frying the, the machine or frying the electrical system of my house. OK, um, it's because things have gone wrong somehow with the parts of the system, right, that you have to have sanctions in place. Um, and that's why we should say that's I said that's the principle. That's what I want to say is the principal distinction between the ex saying the activity of law is to, is to bring about social order by imposing general rules and saying that, oh, yeah, and it does this by producing sanctions, okay? Because I want to say the reason, why we, the reason why we should think this is that when sanctions are used in a legal system, when they're authorized, the point of view of the legal system is that something has gone wrong, okay? Sanctions are not treated as just like part of the normal operating of a legal system. They're treated as... Um, someone has made a mistake, okay? Some failure has taken place, and now our, so to speak, backup system has to be engaged in order to deal with the failure, okay? It's because our, the, our legal system is, you know, uh, is made up of, of, you know, what you might call sort of, you know, people who inadequately respect the law or inadequately understand what the law requires of them, right? Uh, that we need something like sanctions in order to make sure that people are kept in line. OK, to adequately motivated uh, to go along with it, to keep them aware of what's required of them and to keep them motivated to comply. OK, um, so so there's my argument. So, so the argument is that um, is that there's a really, really important difference between the activities that that um, that Hema sort of points out are sort of ubiquitous to legal systems. OK, that some of these do seem to be part and parcel of law's function. Some of these seem to be. Um, treated even by the law itself from the law's own point of view um, as failures that somehow that we need sort of backup systems within the legal system within within the law uh, as we have it in order to correct okay so so you say well why do you why do you say that we call these failures well look right um, when we when we punish someone criminally for the most part uh, there's some weird stuff about strict liability and all that but like for the most part um, we punish people only when we find them guilty. OK, and guilt is not just a word like blah. This is like a label for someone when they violated the law. Right. Um, we're treating them as somehow being in error. OK, having a guilty mind or having engaged in inappropriate behavior. Right. So so uh, and, you know, punishment is expressive of, of condemnation in a way. Right. Um, so the idea is that, uh, you know, sanctions when sanctions are invoked, it's because we're, we're treating people as basically not working very well as parts of the overall legal system. OK, again, sort of from the point of view of the law, something has gone wrong. This is a backup system getting, um, you know, getting employed rather than the, the central functioning uh, of the system itself. Right. Um, or even in like tort law. Right. So some people think tort law, um, which, which deals with compensation. 
uh, for for accidents and other kinds of um, uh, uh, other kinds of wrongful, I shouldn't say, uh, other sorts of unjustified harm falling upon people. Um, you know, so some people think that just a matter of compensation, and maybe that wouldn't fall under the sanctions thing, right? But a lot of people do think that part of the point of tort law um, is to discourage people from engaging in inadequate care with respect to others, right? Um, and again. The, the, you know, the very language of tort law is unreasonableness. Okay, that um, what what if you're if you're being um, if you're if you're being forced to pay um, damages uh, in compensation uh, or in the unusual cases of punitive damages, uh, it's because you've in some way been unreasonable uh, with respect to the care that you've taken others. Again, unreasonable is a defect word. It's a word that explains that you've somehow fallen short with respect to what you should be uh, able to be expected to do. Okay, right. So there's my argument. Um, you know that uh, that uh, that that there's some difference here that I think that you, that doesn't require you to ignore the fact that sanctions are ubiquitous. It's just to sort of enables you to sort of make a distinction between different reasons why sanctions would be ubiquitous. That they're that perhaps they're not part of the central functioning of the legal system, but nevertheless they are necessary given how. Um, given how the parts of a legal system are typically deficient and defective people like us who are acting under laws that are themselves not all that hot, okay, um, it's not at all surprising that one would need that kind of backup system uh, in order for law to sort of be up and functioning. That's why I think that's why I think the relevant of that Raz Aquinas argument is, right? So one, some people take the importance of that argument to just be, um, you know, um, there could be very different creatures who don't need law. And you might think that's not really that powerful, right? So what? Um, you know, the fact that there might be very different beings that don't need um, um, to don't need to pump their blood through their system doesn't mean that hearts don't need to pump blood to be a heart right so it's like well the fact they're just very different beings that doesn't seem to make a huge difference um, I think what's really crucial to these examples is that the the beings that that Raz and Aquinas focus on are beings that lack the relevant defects they're supposed to be fully reasonable beings who if the law is good law is full are fully willing to go along with it OK, um, and so the idea is that in systems where where the rational beings um, who are called upon to comply with these general norms, if they're willing to do so, right, um, the, if they're willing to do so, they don't they aren't they aren't unwilling to do so um, due to their um, unwillingness to cooperate or their or they're being inadequately informed or whatever. Right. Um, then these folks won't need sanctions. The backup system that law has to have given the way that we are, won't have to operate, right? And if that's the case, you would still have just as much of a legal system. You could have just as much of a legal system, even though it wouldn't require sanctions in order to generate the relevant compliance, okay? All right, I wanna say one more thing uh, and then, then we can, I'll, I'll raise a question then I, we can talk about that question. We can talk about anything else that um, that, you, that you all think is, is, is interesting. So, so I do think there is sort of one kind of piece of unfinished business for this sort of theory, um, uh, for, for this, for the for the the Raz Aquinas um, uh, heart position that I've been defending here, right? Um, this is Echo Yanka, uh, who uh, who in a paper uh, called "The Force of Law." Um, so it's also has the same title as as, as Shower's book. Um, um, it's a, it's a paper in the uh, Richmond Law Review. Um, he basically argues this, and I think this is, this is a really powerful, interesting line of argument. He says, "Look, um, here's the thing. Um, you might." You might think that the reason why we have to talk about coercion is because we will be unable to distinguish legal systems from other kinds of social systems, um, similar rule-based institutions, unless we talk about the role that coercion plays, right? So this is like a kind of a theoretical um, theoretical argument or the, the idea is that, um, that we will not be able to distinguish law adequately from other social institutions without appealing to the role that coercion plays in law, okay? I think that's a super interesting challenge, right? Um, so think about it, it's like it's like think about it this way: the rules of of chess clubs, um, uh, social uh, social clubs, right? Um, churches, right? They could some of these are can be analyzed heart style as unions of primary and secondary rules, right? I might have a a, a chess club that where you can talk about what the rule of recognition is, and you know it has all these rules of change and so forth, right? Tells you what your obligations are. It's like, but we wouldn't want to call that a legal system, right? Um, so Yanko's point is like, well, wait a second. Um, is it the case? Maybe it's the case that the only way we can distinguish law from from things like other sorts of rule based systems is by saying that law has a law has a role for coercion that doesn't show up in other systems, right? Um, so there's a challenge, right? There's a challenge, right? Say, can we explain? You know, can the defenders of this view can they explain what it is to be a legal system, right, as opposed to rules of a chess club or a church or whatever, without appealing to the idea? of um, without appealing to the idea of coercion, 
Okay. Uh, if they can't do that, then that's going to be a, a whole nother uh, set of problems uh, for them to deal with, right? So, so folks have ideas about that, or so if you want to want to raise about sort of how how one might try to how one might try to explain what distinguishes the legal system from others without use of coercion. That'd be great to know. Or if any of all have other questions you want to talk about, uh, we can take the rest of the time. Sorry, um, we can take the rest of the time where I can answer some questions. Thanks for that, by the way. So, Mark, can you see the questions that are open? So, let me see. Right. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, so uh, Connor asked a question about um, what's the practical upshot of subscribing to one other view on the relationship between law and coercion. Um, I think this is like, uh, all right, is, can someone, how does someone like John benefit from knowing whether or not his mistreatment comes from law or not? I think it's a really good question. So, um, so, so one thing that I that I'm that I'm I'll say, Connor, I'm not even totally confident about is whether or not this is going to have some sort of practical upshot. Um, so, so, I mean, one thing you might sort of wonder about, um, and this, and so maybe I should have had you, um, maybe you should have mixed the order. So, so Professor Hitz could have shown up, talk about useless knowledge before I, before I came here. Um, I mean, I think for me, the main reasons to think about this question about the connection between law and coercion is not because it has some immediate practical upshot. All right. So maybe it does, Connor, I don't know exactly what it would be. Um, I think the main reasons for thinking about this kind of issue are sort of, sort of two reasons. One is kind of a theoretical issue of the sort that I was raising at the end, that I think that um, it's really, it's, it's theoretically important to be able to distinguish between law and other kinds of social institutions. Uh, I think there is kind of a natural way of sort of going where you say, oh, it's, it has to do with coercion. But I think it's interesting that the flow of legal theory has been away from the idea that this is the right way to distinguish law from other institutions. And I think this can make a difference to sort of how we do like the social science of law and so forth. So, so one of my just sort of theoretical issues. The other I think is, um, is uh, I don't think this is quite practical, Connor. I think this is in terms of like, um, uh, we might think what we call this issue of, of self-understanding, right? So, um, so often when we're trying to understand major social institutions, we're thinking about the state or the family or friendship, right? Or just, I mean, think about, it's like part of the thing, part of what we're trying to do in, in getting a clear understanding of these things is we're trying to understand ourselves, okay? And the institutions that sort of make up this huge aspect of our lives, of our lives. Uh, and I, you know, to me, I think it sort of makes a big difference whether you, whether we sort of how I understand myself in relation to the law, whether I think of myself as a being, a, 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 what I think of myself as an institution that basically what it's about is coercing people and sanctioning people um, or whether I involve an institution that itself is not, doesn't have that kind of essential orientation to sanctioning, um, but rather is something that basically it sanctions because we're not able to be as good and reasonable and rational as we could be, right? Um, I think, so, so again, maybe, maybe you could end up doing sort of all the same things with respect to self-understanding, um, uh, you know, regardless of which view you take. But to me, it, it strikes me, that it seems to me that what you view on the, on the face of it, I think what view you take um, is gonna make a difference to that sort of understanding. Okay, um, Shane. Uh, I should say thanks very much for that. I, I do think this question of practical implication. I think is I think is a tough question. Um, and uh, and I'll say I'll say to y'all what I what I say to my own philosophy law students, which is write a paper on it. <laughs> it's like you know, uh, if you think that if you think it has no practical effect, write a paper that shows me that, or, or if it does, uh, I would I would be happy to know it. Um, so does is Raz's argument is something similar? Uh, failure due to, failures due to our human condition. Yes, I think that, I think that's right. I, I think I think that. Um, you know, I, I think that the reason why I was sort of pointing out that stuff about um, failure is that I think is I think the people in commenting on Raz's argument have have focused simply on the angels being different from us, not on terms of their being better than us. Okay, um, so and I, there's interesting questions about angelology here that I'm not going to go into, but like, um, but the idea is that I, I think it's it's really crucial both on, on Ra, for Raz and Aquinas that it's not just that these are different kinds of beings, right? Because just like I was saying, it's like, well, the fact that there are different kinds of beings that don't need to pump their blood with a heart, right? Maybe they're built in a different way uh, that makes their blood move around. That doesn't, that doesn't call into question the idea that, uh, that our hearts, that, that the, a properly functioning heart pumps, right? So, so the, the mere difference, I think, isn't enough. I think what's crucial um, to, to, to sort of seeing the force of Raz's argument is not just the fact of the difference of angels, but the fact that angels are better. Um, they're 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 less bad at doing what we do within legal with, do within legal systems, which is to give rules that people have good reason to act in accordance with, um, and to uh, do a good job uh, complying uh, with those rules. 
uh, is there a primary aspect of religious system? If not, to, so oh, so Porter asked question: Is there a primary aspect? There better be. Right? So, uh, so I, I was thinking of the primary aspects of the legal system being those the imposition of social order by giving general rules uh, that we have sufficient motivation to comply with. Right. So, so all those first three, right? Um, those three were supposed to be um, what the um, what the uh, what the um, what you know, what 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 Hart and Raz and Aquinas, I think, agree upon um, is that yeah, law is about imposition of social order by giving general rules and so forth, right? Hema just says, oh yeah, and it's to be law, it's got to use this particular technique. You know, the view that I think Hart and Raz um, and uh, and Aquinas give, um, you know, you could either have a very general version of their view where they just say, you know, they might generate compliance in all sorts of ways. They might do it with sanctions. They might do it by being authoritative. They might do it by only requiring of people what they're morally motivated to do anyway. They might do it by, in, in like a very, very religious society, by doing things that they think God will punish them if they don't do, right? That's like outsourcing the sanctions to somebody else. Um, they, might not, they might not authorize any sanctions. They just find know that people are so adequately moved um, by these rules, even without sanctioning, uh, that they don't need to. All right. So, so that's so the idea is like the, the general, the, the the primary, the primary stuff is about um, is about uh, you know impos imposing general rules um, using the kind of primary, but the kind of secondary rule uh, technique that Hart describes um, that people can be adequately motivated to comply with. Uh, you might say that's that's what the primary function. Um, and then you might say there might be all sorts of different techniques um, that folks might use. I said that there, are, you know, you might be more doctrinaire about this. So, so Raz sometimes says that it's authority that law relies upon, right? The law thing treats of its treats its you know law treats its own pronouncements as authoritative um you might think of that as, as as you know adding um as adding a sort of a further sort of constraint on what law would have to be like to be properly functioning um but you you need not say this okay uh keegan this is a long this is a long question so i'm, I'm i know we're out of time but let me um if people need to bail on this thing um so how do legal systems without sanctions maintain the concept of authority figure that doles out the laws uh what can do with actively disobeys laws besides coerce them um okay so so right so so um so this is so what what Raz and um, and even Aquinas right um, uh, agree upon is that in actual legal systems um, people are the, the, that there's a, a whale of a lot of coercion that goes on okay but let me one thing and and uh, and so their arguments have to do with the, so the, the key bit of their argument is whether this is because of a failure um, rather than rather than sort of the, Serving the primary function of the system. I mean, but one thing I do, I'll, I'll go back, to, circle back to Tyler here for a second. I said one thing I said it's really, really, really easy to overestimate is how much legal um, compliance depends upon the fact of sanctions. Um, again, uh, you know, this is not me being the philosopher saying, "Oh, let me do this a priori." Look at the social science. Okay, the social science on this is that there's an awful lot. Um, there's an awful lot of compliance that's generated from the fact of the sense of legitimacy, right? And part of the sense of legitimacy involves. Um, fairness of procedures in generating the law, the content of the law that's produced, um, whether folks take themselves to be under some kind of authority, right? So whether they think themselves to have consented to, law, to the law or that they're not doing their fair share if they don't, uh, if they don't um, go along, whatever, right? So there may be all sorts of reasons that you might roughly call really moral reasons, okay, that people are in fact motivated by um, that would explain an awful lot of law, uh, a lot of awful lot of law compliance, okay? Now, so um, and and what and and just you know the 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 Raz Hart Aquinas point is just that it's kind of a contingent matter how much we have to depend on sanctions in order to get people to comply enough in a legal system, um, and when and when we do have to rely upon sanctions, um, it's characteristically because um, these what you might think of as the primary way that law presents itself as authoritative and fair, right? That, that it's failed. Right, or the people, or it's either failed to, to give solutions that are authoritative and fair, um, or that people are not adequately responding to the authority um, and uh, and goodness of law in deciding what to do. Da, 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 da. Right. Oh, so this this state of being. So so Mihir says um, this idea of uh, in order to maintain a state of being in a group. I mean, and I, right, I should I should mention that as well. So so you might say that that on top of that's a really good point. That's really great. Um, you might think that there's another sort of explanation that's not merely moral. Um, at least not in any sort of straightforward way, and it's not merely sanctions. You might think it's something like associative, right? You might think that it's part of one's self-identity as a law-abiding person or as a good Georgian or a good Virginian or a good American or whatever um, that one that one does what the law tells one to do. Um, and you might think that that's, again, that, 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 I, mean, I think that's not reducible either to sanctions on one side or morality on the other, okay? Um, again, about this other thing, you know, I, you know, if you're interested, you know, 
if you have good thoughts on this, let me know. I mean, because because one of these questions about sort of how we ought to think about um, legal what distinguishes legal systems from other rule based systems if we don't use coercion, coercion, I think it's one of the live issues of legal philosophy. Um, so you can make a real contribution by saying something cool and interesting about it. We're out of questions and we're out of time. I think. Cool. That was that was great. Um, thank you very much. Um, if anybody else has questions remaining from this or suggestions for the middle ground, um, I should have turned on my video, uh, you know, send, send me a note if you want and I'll, I'll send it on to Dr. Murphy as well. But Dr. Murphy, thank you very much for today. Uh, and I'll let Andrew I do whatever it is he has to do. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks for showing up, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't get to, see, get to see your faces. That sort of weirded me out a little bit. But but thanks for coming. And I appreciate I appreciate the thought. I thought the questions were super interesting as well. Yes. Thanks to everybody for joining us, and our special thanks to Dr. Murphy for sharing his time with us. And again, let me remind everybody that our speaker series for the spring continues. Please check out the details at ethics.gsu.edu. Dr. Murphy, thank you once again, and I hope everybody has a great day. Be well. Bye bye. Take care.